Ladies and gentlemen, Damen und Herren, Dames und Herren. In 2010, the International House of Literature, Passaporta, welcomed Robert Manasse as one of its writers in residence. We offer an apartment to 10 to 15 selected authors each year to enable them to focus on their personal writing project. I remember Robert Manasse as particularly driven. He returned several times that year and also in 2016 to work on his Brussels project. It won't come as a surprise that the writer's apartment where he stayed is situated at the Vieux Marché au Grain. This square is the setting of the opening scene of Manasse's book, Die Hauptstadt, the capital. In this prologue, he introduces several characters against the backdrop of a setting that is all too familiar to all of us at Passaporta. But we have never seen the pig. <laughs> its presence surprises the characters too. It's one of the fascinating aspects of this novel. The real and the surreal intricately intertwined. It tells us something about this fascinating and perhaps at times also unruly city. And this is a shared concern for both Passaporta and Gavias, looking for stories a city has to tell. So we are very grateful for the City Theatre's hospitality to host tonight's talk together with us and with the support of Arbeiterspers and Goethe Institute. The Hauptstadt was awarded the Deutsche Buchpreis and has found a large readership in the original German language. And tonight we're broadening the scope in presenting the Dutch translation, The Hofstadt by Paul Beers, published by Arbeiterspers. The German book, as well as, as its Dutch translation, can be purchased after the talk, and the, writing is, and the writer is willing to sign your copy in the foyer. There's no English translation available yet, but it will be published in French next year by Verdier. Olivier Manoni, the French translator, kindly sent us a fragment of his work in progress to use tonight to accompany Manasse's reading from the book. Besides reading from it, Robert Manasse will talk about his book, his view on Brussels and the EU, with the Belgian writer Geert van Istendal and politician and former European Commissioner Karel de Gucht. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Geert van Istendaal, Robert Menasse, Karel de Gucht. Dames en heren, mesdames en messieurs, meine dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen. Wij zijn hier vanavond samen om een heugelijke Europese gebeurtenis te vieren en om een groot Europees schrijver te beluisteren. Nous sommes ici ce soir à la fois pour célébrer un heureux événement européen et pour écouter un grand écrivain européen. Wir sind hier zusammengekommen um ein ganz besonderes europäisches Ereignis zu feiern und einem großen europäischen Autor zuzuhören. Autor zuzuhören. We are here together to celebrate a great European event and to listen to a great European author. Robert Manasse. Ja, so is diese Stadt. Voilà cette ville, dit is deze Stadt. Um, geboren 1954, 1954, uh, wenen Vienne, Wien. Studeerde Germanistik, Philosophie, Politik, Wissenschaft, donc Langue Germanique, Philosophie, Science, Politik. Zeven jaar lector aan de Universiteit de São Paulo. Pendant sept ans, il a enseigné à l'Université de São Paulo, entre autres, littérature autrichienne, dus onder meer ook Oostenrijkse literatuur. Zijn debuut, son premier roman, zijn roman debuut, 1988, Zinnige Gewissheid, 1991, Zelige Zeiten, Brugge Welt, Philosophische Kriminalroman und Jüdische Familiengeschichte. À la fois polar philosophique et histoire d'une famille juive, Les Origines Juives de Joodse Herkomst van Robert Manasse, vind je ook in de indrukwekkende roman Die Vertreibung aus der Hölle. Qui décrit l'évasion de menacés ben Israël au XVIIe siècle 
un ancêtre de l'écrivain et son arrivée dans la ville libre à cette époque d'Amsterdam. Op mij zelf hebben zijn Frankfurter poëtiek voorlezen een grote indruk gemaakt. Die zerstoring der Welt als wille und Vorstellung, conférence impressionnante sur, eh bien, sur notre temps et notre avenir. Heerlijk provocerend, par exemple, pour ne citer qu'une provocation, que le livre de Karl Marx Das Kapital est un des très très grands romans du 19e siècle. Op 21 maart 2017 viel Robert Menasse de Eertebeurt het Europees Parlement toe te spreken à l'occasion du 60e anniversaire du Traité de Rome. Es ist eine äußerst kritische Rede eines Autors, der fest und tief von der Notwendigkeit eines die Mitgliedstaaten übersteigenden Europas überzeugt ist. Es ist eine äußerst kritische Redevoering von einem eminent Schreiber, die diep overtuigd ist von der Notzaak van een Europa dat de lidstaat overstijgt. En dan nu, met een andere, ce roman, die hauptstad. Maar, wij zijn hier vanavond samen, omdat hij vertaald is in het Nederlands, door de trouwe en uitnemende vertaler van zijn andere boeken, Paul Beers, hulde aan Paul Beers dus ook vanavond. Il faut quand même mentionner le travail des traducteurs, Qui reste dans We vieren dus vanavond de Nederlandse vertaling van een roman die als hoofdspeler, hoofdspeler heeft deze stad. C'est donc la traduction néerlandaise d'un roman que nous célébrons ce soir, roman dont le protagoniste est cette ville, deze stad, die hauptstad Europas, Belgiens, Flanders, Wallonië en zo weiter. De Nederlandse vertaling, de Nederlandse vertaling van een boek geschreven in het Duits door een gevierd Oostenrijk schrijver. La traduction néerlandaise d'un livre écrit en allemand par un écrivain autrichien célébré. Son livre a d'ailleurs, vous l'avez entendu, reçu le prix du livre allemand 2017. Logisch gevolg, conséquence logique, folgerichtiger schluss. We zullen vanavond Engels spreken. <laughs> Aber Robert Manasse wird vorleben auf Deutsch mit Übersetzungen, also Französisch, Niederländisch, wie es sich gehört. And now we start the conversation, we switch to the official language of the Imperium Trumpanum. <laughs> uh, my dear Robert Manasse, you have been researching for this really, in my eyes, magnificent book, for years and years, but most of the time in most European countries, people don't notice Brussels at all. If it is not the source of bad news, bureaucratic uh, interference, sloppy government and what have you, why does an Austrian author, you're not a German author, an Austrian author like you, become obsessed by this our bureaucratic hellhole, Brussels? <laughs> First of all, uh, I'm not an Austrian author. I'm a Viennese author. And, uh, <laughs> and at the same time, a uh, European citizen. And as a European citizen, I wanted to know more precisely and more intimately how this most important political project in my lifetime the European <coughs> Unification Project is working in details, in, in concrete mm -hmm. details, or why it is not so good working. Um, but before I give you the answer, uh, please allow me, first of all, to take a photo of you. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. 
it up. I have a Facebook account. <laughs> and I never know what to put. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I thought once that uh, what makes more sense than to publish a photo of a qualified public. Um, then my question is um, to you. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't I read before, uh, or we start immediately with the conversation? We so already have started with the conversation. Yeah. Okay, we can continue. It's foreseen that there's a stuff for this. But um, I would feel more comfortable reading uh, because I fear the conversation with you. Ah. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's Don't easy. Don't be afraid. Uh, I'm an old I, I, I man. Remember, I remember very well when I, when I came to Brussels and we met first, mm -hmm. um, thanks to Passaporta, mm -hmm. which brought us together to first conversation, first discussions. And you started to show me your city, you, mm -hmm. you started to show me Brussels. And there was uh, the Austrian television at. Um, my first uh, presentation at Passaporta, and you gave an interview to the, to the Austrian television saying um, he's a nice guy, but uh, it's completely crazy that a Viennese, they coming from Vienna, um, uh, trying to write a novel which is passing in, in Brussels, uh, this will never get a real, rational, um, good uh, exit. Oh, well, and, it doesn't uh, I remember have, this. It doesn't have a rational good exit. Has it? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's the way I read it. <laughs> how, how could a novel situated in Brussels have a, a rational good exit? Is this the reason why not even a Brussels writer even wrote a Brussels novel before? I wrote a Brussels novel. Yes, yes. yes. Well, you didn't. But you only gave but, me but, your what is interesting yeah. to note is that <laughs> he wrote a very good Brussels novel and then he moved to uh, 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 another place to live in. Yeah, between Moors and Woods, yes, <laughs> okay, last uh, a few months ago. Um, uh, Mr. Gucht, Mr. you uh, have, of course, a, a, um, an impressive European pedigree. You were a European Member of Parliament. Uh, you were a uh, foreign minister of this country, you were a European commissar. Hmm? Uh, the image of the European functionaries in this book is in my, in my eyes, as I read it, uh, far from flattering. Do you think it's accurate? The image of the European uh, careers, uh, Cypriot women, uh, Czech, Czech functionaries, and so on? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that could you, you could say of everybody in, in Europe and probably in the world. I mean, this, uh, the, the, the story, it, it's about um, um, human interaction be, between uh, uh, officials in the European Commission. Uh, and then you, you see that, uh, of course, they, 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 they're point of view is very well, uh, is very much inspired by their uh, origins. And you have this uh, Cypriot woman, uh, uh, Fiona Xenopoulou, and that's her name. Uh, and and uh, she is uh, uh, Cypriot. Uh, to, to get out of Cyprus, she, she got the Greek nationality. And then when she could get a promotion, being a Cypriot, she uh, again became a Cypriot. Whether that is a, a, an, um, no, but whether that is specific for the European Commission, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's very specific for the human race that you adapt yourself. Uh, and and what, what is, uh, I mean, this, uh, this part of the plot, huh? I mean, uh, uh, I will say something on, on the rest of the plot as well, but it's part of the plot to put together a kind of a, man, a manifestation and a jubilation of, of 50 years of, of European Commission. And then you, you see uh, how they try to put it uh, into place and then you have this uh, there are objections by a member, number of member states, for example, by the Polish, that say, look, you cannot do that. Uh, you cannot say that uh, Auschwitz, it was uh, Polish, it was German. Uh, that, that's real. I mean, 
also recently now there has been a lot of fuss in, 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 uh, in Warsaw about that, huh? that uh, uh, now can get into prison for three years if you say that uh, Auschwitz was Polish. So this is, I think this is, is a description of, of, of normal life, whether that is specific for uh, European bureaucrats, I, I wouldn't say so. I know rather well the European bureaucracy. Uh, I have also known other bureaucracies. And I would like to make two remarks. First of all, um, almost all bureaucracies are good. I mean, I've worked as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. and I have always been of the opinion that this was a very good bureaucracy and that we had very good people. And of course, there were some that were not good and, and that uh, were nasty and, and that uh, uh, were not, uh, you couldn't trust, etc. But okay, that's uh, in society as well. And then I went to the European uh, uh, Commission, and there I, I met the bureaucrats, the bureaucrats, huh? the, the, the bureaucrats, the, bureauc and the eurocrats, the eurocrats, yes, that, the, the, right. that are very much hated. And I have to say that this is, an, uh, uh, is a wonderful administration. I mean, made of, of very, very, very yeah. made of very, very intelligent people yeah. that uh, have, a, and that also, and that, that's I believe very important. That uh, at least in the European Commission, most of them do not have a national. Um, approach. Most of them have a European approach, which is, uh, I mean, if there was already kind of, of an, um, uh, a European demos that starts to develop, that's certainly the case in the European bureaucracy. So you won't, I mean, although I, you know I'm a liberal, but I, I, I'm not against the bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. No? And you agree with that? You, uh, you wrote a, a very good non fiction book, too. All your books are very good. Mm -hmm. The Europäische Landbote, clear reference to Büchner. Uh, on so uh, and the image of the European uh, functionary is very positive here. Yeah. He is rational, he is efficient, uh, has a higher education, speaks five or six or seven languages and so on. And here I don't find this back. Though Mr. De Hucht seems to suggest that this is a very realistic novel. Do you agree with that? Um, I'm very greedy always for, to harmony, so I agree with both of you. <laughs> um, but it's, that's the, the basic truth, uh, is um, there is um, uh, no civilization possible without bureaucracy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is a fact. Mm -hmm. This is yeah? the Babylonians, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a fact. And um, there are um, a lot of uh, uh, completely irrational, wrong, false uh, sites on the Brussels bureaucracy, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you speak with people in any corner or place in, in Europe or in Vienna or in, mm -hmm. in other, ci other European cities, in <coughs> Cyprus, in Malta or, mm -hmm. or wherever, they all will tell you uh, that's uh, completely, completely crazy to have uh, in Brussels this enormous bureaucracy full of people with no contact to reality mm -hmm. yeah, um, and so on. And it's it's uh, it's a moloch. It's uh, it's something uh, completely uh, irrationally growing uh, mm -hmm. and 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 um, interfering in the in the real life uh, mm, with yeah. completely crazy decisions. And um, when you come to Brussels, as I did, and you go into these institutions and you try to 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 speak with them and to make research and what are they doing. Uh, um, how they are trying to, to, to uh, uh, proceed with the European idea and European project and so on, you learn uh, uh, very fast that um, um, the image which European bureaucracy has in all over Europe is not true. Yeah? It has nothing to do with reality. For example, the city of Vienna has more civil servants for the administration of the city of Vienna than the commission has for the U administration of, of, uh, of Europe. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it is not a 
bureaucratic monster. The European Union is not a bureaucratic <laughs> monster. And the second thing what you learn is uh, that our highly qualified uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, people working there. Yeah? And um, uh, <coughs> normally uh, really engaged with the European idea. This is a fact. At the same time, uh, it is clear that a lot of things are not working. Yeah. We have a lot of unproductively contradictions. We have a lot of uh, problems and crises. Um, so uh, this is the reason at the same time for um, uh, so many European citizens to, 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 to doubt on the, mm -hmm. on, the, on the sense and the future of the European project. And what I learned and what I am suggesting for um, the European discussion, for discussion of European politics is defend the European idea and criticize the status quo. And what I tried in, uh, in my novel, mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, I, 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 I did it in two different books. Mm -hmm. In my essay, I tried to, to make a reconstruction of the European idea, of the ideas of the founding fathers of the European Union. Yeah? The idea which is forgotten even by um, contemporary political elites. Yeah? Um, no, if you, if you have a conversation with Angela Merkel, uh, uh, by all benefits uh, she, she shows, she has no idea what Jean Monnet said, for example. Yeah? She, didn't see, she didn't see the misery uh, after the, the Second World War, um, uh, uh, what, um, uh, what uh, Helmut Kohl, for example, have, has seen, yeah. Yeah, and he knows uh, that every every ste political step in German inner politics has to be um, um, uh, vinculated to an European step mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. For a simple example, if we would not have the Euro today, and it would depend on <coughs> Angela Merkel, we would not get the common currency. That's a fact. Because she doesn't understand the goal. She is a mastermind of balancing yeah. out uh, yeah. contradictions by waiting yeah. and making conversation. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And what I tried in, in this uh, longer essay is to remember, as well the political elites of today, what was the idea? Why, why do we have this, this, this revolutionary project? And it is a revolution, even uh, uh, when it is proceeding only in very, very small little steps. So it is a slowly revolution, but it is a revolution. Never before in history, in one city, the, the laws and the conditions of living of a whole continent were made in one city. That's absolutely new. And never before in the newer European history, uh, the idea, the idea um, um, uh, were tried to realize to overcome nationalism. Yeah? This is a revolutionary, a revolutionary idea and therefore I tried to, to, to make a reconstruction of, 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 of what the founding fathers of the European project intended. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with this novel, I tried to, to tell in a realistic way how it is today. And there is no reason to say everything is perfect. No, no, no. Yeah? no. I think I, if you uh, allow me... Uh, yeah, no. No. Um, I like very much the idea that you say this was revolutionary. And that's, that's telling because uh, normally uh, a revolution within 10 years is over and it eats its children. So this is a very, how would I say, 
well-conceived revolution because it's still existing after 70 years. Yeah. And there have been several attempts to demolish it and it never worked. I mean, they, nobody can demolish it, in fact. I mean, the, they take the, the, the British, they, they, they want to get <coughs> out. And uh, the door is open to get out, but they don't know how to get out. You know? I mean, and, and because this is... <laughs> no, but it is true, because it is such an intricate system. It's just an, a very intricate system that makes it almost impossible to leave. I mean, they, this is the... Um, it's a historic mistake that they are making, but it, it demonstrates that this was a very well-conceived revolutionary idea. That's my first remark. The second one, um, it's about the uh, European Monetary Union. Um, we could have a separate discussion on that on the Monetary Union and whether it came at the right moment, uh, uh, whether it was accompanied by the uh, necessary measures, and it was not. But why did it come about? It came about because uh, when you had the reunification of Germany, Mitterrand, who was then the president of France, in fact was against it. Uh, and he even said it a couple of times publicly and, and he's, he felt that, I mean, that he couldn't continue that line. And then he made an agreement with, with Kohl, whereby he said, look, you can have the German reunification, but you will have to accept the European currency. And then Kohl said, okay, but it will be a European currency with a, a European Central Bank uh, on, a, on, a, on a German model. So this was a, a very political design once again, mm -hmm. because if you look at it from an economic or a monetary point of view, probably it was not the right moment to do so. So that's very important, I believe, in, in European history, that you look at this in terms of uh, uh, political decisions. And what is amazing to me is that although there are a lot of uh, misunderstandings and difficulties and whatever, that when they have to take a decision, a political decision, okay, they are with their backs against the wall, but they take the decision. So um, it is very, very difficult, I believe, to unravel the European integration. And what we uh, underestimate is um, the idea that, for example, the, uh, uh, the Americans have, I mean, not Trump, of course, but... Uh, he has no idea, so it would be difficult. But, um, uh, for example, you, uh, you, you meet scholars in uh, um, political science uh, that they... You, may, you mean U.S. scholars? Yeah, U.S. Yeah. scholars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they all find this an amazing evolution that we have been able to do this, to, in fact, reunite a continent by peaceful means. That has been happening several times with, uh, with Caesar and, and with... Uh, Carl Napoleon. the Great, Napoleon, Carl, uh, Carl Charles V, and, and you name it always Hitler. Hitler. by force. But it's the first time ever that yeah. we try to do it uh, in a peaceful way, and yeah. even after 70 years, it is still there, which is an amazing feature in uh, modern history. Yeah, that's a revolution. Yeah. But, but you say, uh, one of your, um, Fritsch is called, uh, one of the, the, the officials says, uh, it, it, it's petering out. The last uh, real uh, commission president was Jacques Delors. Yes. And afterwards, we just had puppets on strings. Yes. So that's not a good evolution. Uh, and is he no, right? But, he, uh, he rise. but Heidegger uh, said it uh, um, so precisely that uh, normally, um, after 10 years, the revolution eats uh, its own children. Yeah. And what we, with this completely new form and, uh, of revolution are uh, seeing now is after 60 years the children are eating the revolution. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this is what's happening now. Yeah? Mm. And uh, it's so hard to, to, to explain um, uh, to the people in, <coughs> in this moment of backlash we are seeing without doubt what is happening. Yeah? National states are uh, making blockades, uh, are, are making uh, vetoes, and are making um, uh, politics against the Union for getting the national votes. Yeah? So the European Union is not really working because of the, of the, of the conflict with the national states. And then, uh, in, the national in the nation states, the, the political elites say, you see, European Union is not working. 
we have to find a national solution. Yeah? And um, this is uh, what's happening now. And everybody who is insisting in the European idea, which had a progress over 60 years, is called an utopist. Yeah? And the, pra the, the, um, the pragmatic way is um, uh, finding uh, uh, lousy compromises uh, between that's, nations. That's politics, yeah. lousy compromises. I mean, yes, uh, yes. It, 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 yeah. compromises yeah. Are, are, are most of the time not very beautiful to, to look at. But like Bismarck yeah. said, uh, you, you take a sausage, you don't want to, what, to know what's inside, but yeah. you <laughs> eat it. Yeah. Yeah. No. We, we Belgians but know about a, a lousy compromises. It's, 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 exactly this, no, but it's exactly the same at, at, the, at the national level, you know. I mean, either you have compromises and then you have a, a democratic system. Yes. Or you don't have compromises anymore and then you get into dictatorship. That's what yeah. Yeah, now no, is happening in China. Is, no? Excuse me. The, dif the, difference, the difference between yeah. the 50 years and the last 10 years, yeah. the difference is... That's not true. The difference is the compromises were done uh, in the perspective to continue and to go further with the European project. And there wasn't possible to go in big steps, so the compromise was a small step. And now, the last 10 years, we have compromises which are always um, uh, nodding and, and accepting uh, a backlash. And this is not, in my sense, a democratic um, uh, compromise uh, compared with the idea yeah. and the goal of the European Union. No, I, I, I really can't agree with that. Um, first of all, it is since the moment that Europe has become more democratic that you have more compromises. When you look at the way that the European Union has been construed founding by, the, fathers, yeah. by the founding fathers, uh, yeah. amongst them uh, Paul Henri Spark, for Spark, example, Schumann, Monet, um, uh, De Gasperi, De Gasperi uh, yeah, uh, Mitt, um, this Hallstein. was this was not this was not very democratic. You know, it was behind closed doors. In fact, we have uh, constructed the whole thing behind closed doors. I've, excuse me, one, one phrase. I've never found open doors in the national democracy. Never. Let, let's, let's talk about uh, uh, Austria I afterwards, voted, I voted in a... Rep <laughs> no, let's talk about <laughs> Austria afterwards. <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate chapter. Mm. Uh, and then uh, everybody said, look, uh, we have had this uh, a direct election of the European Parliament for the first time in 79. Now we need a more democratic European Union. And at this moment in time, the European Union has become very, very democratic. Because you have a European Commission that is making proposals, and that is, I think, a very good uh, bureaucracy, and you need it. Without the bureaucracy, everything would fall apart. But, and then you have uh, a parliament, European parliament, with a lot of competences, many more than any national parliament you can imagine. And the council, they, and that's in fact kind of a bicam bicameral system. It, but by the way, exactly the same rules as the American Congress. And it is because it has become so democratic, which was a necessity, that you see much more openly what is happening. And that people are astonished by what is happening because they don't understand it anymore. But uh, Europe has become very, very democratic. First remark. Second remark. You say the last 10 years nothing happened. Uh, that's not true. For example, we had to master the... Uh, financial crisis in 2008 without a toolbox. There was no toolbox. There was a European currency, but for example, there was no stability fund. There was no uh, uh, system to uh, uh, unravel banks. Uh, there was no possibility for, for direct interventions in the monetary markets, etc., etc. So we had to do it without any toolbox. And we nevertheless managed it. In the meantime, we have been the, uh, uh, the, the leading uh, uh, big group of countries, continent or whatever you mean, with respect to climate change. When there is now uh, an, the Paris Agreement on climate change, it's because of the European Union, and by the way, it is because of the European Commission, and within the European Commission, it's because uh, there was a, a Belgian Director General, eh, by the there way. Was, there was. Yeah, it, is, it is like that, I mean. He has been thrown away. No, uh, no, no he was very close to his uh, pension. That, yes, that's but, something else. But, no, but he did a very no. good job. 
And normally you have he to. Did, he did an excellent job. Oh, yes. No, but normally you have Fantastic. to. Rest, no, but normally you have to rotate it. after oh, yes. five <laughs> years. And he was there for it. That's, that's, that's the nitty gritty of it. But what I'm saying is, it is not true that nothing is happening in the European Union. And since the financial crisis, we have built, for example, the banking union, which was extremely difficult to do. You, do you have any idea how many banks there are in Europe? Do you have any idea about it? More than 5,000. And we have centralized uh, the, 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 the whole uh, uh, control of, of, of the banking system. So I think if now something were happening, we are much better equipped. And then on the personnel. I've worked for five years with Mr. Barroso, for five years. And you will never hear me say anything bad about him. This guy has been working for eight years, for 10 years in fact, day and night, seven days every week. I Whenever I needed him, even during the weekend, I could hold him. And now you have a, a commission president that is only here for two and a half days. But you cannot blame for that his predecessors. You cannot do that. I believe you, uh, what you tell about Barroso. The problem is not that it didn't work. The problem is that before he started to work, he asked the council what they need. No, that's not true. Will you, um, uh, you, you just want um, the council to be abolished, eh? In the sense of uh, overcoming nationalism, it would be sensible. Mm -hmm. And it is, the, the, it is the objective goal of this slow revolution. And um, we should come nearer, step by step, to this moment uh, that we, ha we get a common market, we have a common market, a single market, we have a common currency, but we don't have a European, a real post-national national European democracy. We have um, uh, a, um, a, a common economy on the single market, but we make the balance uh, in national economic terms and national economy doesn't exist anymore. The only people who don't know that are the national economists in the national governments. Um, uh, it's easy. You see in the, in, the, in the actual construction, institutional construction of the European Union, you see in every point the, the unproductive uh, contradiction. We have the Commission as the supranational institution making the proposals for common politics for this continent. Okay. And this is a very qualified uh, bureaucracy and very qualified people are working there and they are really Europeans. On the top level, the national states put in the national uh, delegates of yeah, <coughs> uh, um, and, 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 and commissioners um, uh, uh, and, and um, in, the, in the European Parliament you have the first European Parliament in history. At the same time, you can vote for it only in national lists. Yeah? And you have the goal to build a post-national European Republic. And the last decision have the national state leaders in the European Council. You find in every point, in every moment of the actual construction of the European Union, this contradiction. And I understand that it couldn't have been different from the very beginning on, because at the beginning, the national leaders, as only democratic legitimated leaders, had to come together to decide together the first steps to make a post-national democracy in Europe. But then they realized, <laughs> wait a moment, wait a moment, we are abolishing uh, ourselves. Yeah? And then the resistance began. And this is the, this is the reason for the multiple crises we are living now uh, in Europe. I give you one, one typical example. You, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the problem with banks and the, and the currency and so on. When the decision was made that uh, we get the euro, the common currency, the European Commission proposed um, um, a concept for political 
um, uh, uh, how to say, um, uh, 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 politische uh, mittel, yeah, also, uh, political tools, tools uh, t for managing the, 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 the common currency. They said, in the history of all currencies in the world, never a currency existed without uh, accompanied, uh, being accompanied by financial politics, uh, fiscal politics, bank politics, and mm -hmm. so yeah. on. Yeah. And they said, okay, we have to clear this. And the council said, no. We accept a common currency, but we don't accept any common politics around it. For example, Germany said, we are not interested in bank uh, or, or stock market controlling and in financial politics um, in Brussels because we have the stock market Frankfurt. We are not interested at all that Brussels can have an in-view or interfering in the, in the Frankfurt stock market. And then he said, everybody, okay, uh, Germany is so important and we will accept what Germany says. And so the... the the, the euro was the first currency without accompanying um, mm -hmm. uh, political um, uh, possibilities <coughs> for managing the currency. That was not the, the first one, but... Uh, yeah. No, the Kauri Muschel was before, but it was the last one before. But, uh, mm -hmm. but let me first uh, get back to uh, what my understanding of European democracy is. I mean, yeah. um, okay. um, I, I don't like the council, that's something else, because I have had so many problems with them, but... Uh, That's natural. Um, you know, uh, when you look at a human being, they always have two legs, you know, and two feet. If you are missing one, then it's very unstable. And I believe that in European democracy, you have two sources of legitimation. On the one hand, you have the direct election of the European Parliament, or the members of the European Parliament. I've been a member of the European Parliament for 14 years. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors of the Spinelli report, so I, I've, I've seen the, this whole evolution. So you have the direct election of the European Parliament, and that's a, a legitimation. But it is not enough to give the legitimation to the whole European construction. I would like that in the future it, it would be like that, but at this moment in time this is not realistic. Because you also have a, a second source of uh, democratic legitimation, and that's the representation of the national governments that, by the way, are also democratically legitimated in the European Council and in the Council of Ministers. You need these two and you need to balance them. And you balance them by a co-decision procedure which makes that, in fact, the, uh, uh, the Council and the Parliament are on an equal footing. That's, 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 that's how the European democracy works. And I believe that at this moment in time is, is the only possibility that over time, you know, the, uh, the council will disappear. Um, we are not, uh, we are not, uh, it, it won't happen in our lifetime because we have, we, we were born in the same year, so it's, uh, I think it will not happen in my lifetime and uh, not necessarily in yours either. But uh, we know what, we don't know what is going to happen afterwards. Because if you look at the European history, it's, uh, whenever you make a progress, a step forward, it's always a um, supranational step forward and also accompanied by an intergovernmental step forward. That's what you see in, in, in the 70 years that have passed now. Then on the, uh, on the monetary union, what you say is true. Um, but you could say that of everything that has happened in the past in the European Union, also, for example, when we made the internal market, uh, the approach of many was to say, look, we need accompanying policies because if not, it will never work. If we had waited for the accompanying policies, there would never have been an internal market. If we had have, uh, uh, waited for the uh, accompanying policies uh, for a, a European currency, there would never have been a European currency, policy, uh, currency excuse me, because you have mm -hmm. two approaches. Huh? On the one hand, you say, look, you do it, and then you see what has to be fixed mm -hmm. afterwards, mm -hmm. and we had to fix it yeah. after the financial it. crisis. <laughs> or you have what they uh, call in German the Kronings theory. First, you have all the accompanying policies, and then you have the monetary union. But that would never work in Europe. Europe does not work on the basis of this is the best thing we should do, and we can do, and so we should do it now. No, we do it when we are with our backs 
against the wall. But that's not limited to Europe, by the way. That, that's, I think, uh, one of the uh, characteristics of, of, uh, of, of democracy, that there has to be some pressure before you take uh, decisions. But that's, that's how it worked. And yes. you can be for or against, by the way, you are for. But, and I, I, I think that it's very important that you have people in, uh, that uh, have uh, a utopist approach. I mean, and, and not, I'm not kidding, I'm, I'm meaning this. Mm. But uh, on the other hand, uh, myself having been active in these circles for about four decades, that's, I believe, what is possible. And so it's the art of the possible. And without the art of the possible, yeah. Europe would never have developed. The art of the possible is a, is a, is a very good point. Um, our generation had one day in our lifetime which was a tremendously intensive teacher of the art of the possible. It was the 9th of November of 89. On 8th of November of 89, nobody knew that the Berlin Wall will fall. Right. And every <coughs> person who had this experience in his lifetime should never, ever repeat something is not possible. <laughs> Especially, and what I, what I can't understand is that we have political leaders today they forgot, okay, they forgot the history of what happened 100 years ago, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. But all political leaders we have today, all political elites today in Europe have the experience of the 9th of November of 89. And when they are confronted with an idea which is necessary, intelligent, um, uh, and, and um, a perspective of the, of the, of the progreeding of wellness and, and peace of this continent. And they say, it's not possible, not in our lifetime. Then I answer, in our lifetime, the 9th of November of 89 was possible. And uh, for example, to say, um, it's part of European democracy that we have to find compromises between the, the, the nation states and members of the European Union, and they are democratically uh, legitimized. And we have to, we have to uh, find all these compromises between uh, the member states. I would like to remember that this means, and I read it every day in the newspaper, for example, that when finally Germany will find back in his leading role in Europe, or the, the German and French uh, connection as a leaders, of leaders of the European progress, then I can't understand that everybody obviously has forgotten that one of the reasons for the founding of the European Unification Project was to, to guarantee that Germany never again will have a leading role in, Germany, in, in Europe. Yeah? And me, me as a European citizen with an Austrian passport, with the right to vote in Austrian parliament, knowing that whatever the Austrian government will decide yeah, is completely uninteresting in terms of what is the German financial minister deciding. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with democracy when the German financial minister can cut the income of Greek uh, teachers for 40%. <laughs> it's not, this is not, has nothing to do with democracy, yeah. but it has to do with the actual system. And so, therefore, I always try to convince people like you in political responsibility to see that we have to overcome this exact and precise situation to, 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 to come to an, 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 a real European democracy, to a European republic. 
a part of democracy is the equality of citizens um, um, in the system. And an Oster, a, a citizen of a small country is not equal in Europe today to a citizen of a leading country. Yeah? This is a fact. Let, let me... Um, let, let me say something on compromise, you know, because you say, look, mm. they always have to make compromises. Why do they have to make compromises? They have to make compromises because they have to vote. You vote, for example, in the Council of Ministers, and when you want to uh, have something accepted, you need a majority. You need a qualified majority. Yes. Now, to get a qualified majority of 28 countries, you have to find a compromise, because if you let people just vote for what they really would like, then you have 10, 15 different opinions. And you, you don't have a majority and you cannot decide. So that the rule of democracy is that you have to build a majority in the council to vote, in the European Parliament to vote. And you only can build that majority by making compromises. So a compromise is an essential result, an essential um, uh, feature in a democratic this is my uh, yeah, but no, but you say I'm against compromise. You cannot no, have, I'm not against you compromise. Cannot have a, no, but you cannot have a democratic system without compromise building. You simply cannot have that. Then it's not democratic anymore because you need to find a majority for something. Now, on Greece. On Greece. I remember very well that in the beginning of the financial crisis in 2008, there was a discussion in the Commission and uh, there was a commissioner, the highest commissioner, who said, uh, McGreevy, who said, look, we knew that, you know, that they were cheating us, the Greeks, when they became a member of the European, of the, of the European monetary system, because at that moment in time, he was the finance minister of his country, or economic minister, I don't know anymore. So they knew that they were cheated. Now, when you look at all the money that has been disbursed to Greece over the last 25 years since they became a member of the European Union, it's amazing. It's about 4% of their national budget on a, on, on a continuous basis. And where has all this money gone? To the yes. German bank? No, 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 to not, not to the German yes, banks. Absolutely. No, no. absolutely. But, that, that, but that's, by the way, that's not the point. The point is that this no, money is. has not been properly used. And why has this money not been properly used? Because the Greeks did not properly administer it. And one of the, the, the weaknesses of the European Union is that you have the structural funds, the regional funds, the social fund, the agricultural fund, and uh, that it's a bunch of money and you give it to the member states and they can decide how they use it. Mm -hmm. So you need much more control on European funds. And if there had been European control on these European funds, then the situation of Greece would have been completely, completely different. And whether it goes to a German bank or to an Australian bank or to a Belgian bank, that, that's not important. What has happened is that the money has not been used for the reasons it had been decided and distributed for. And that's also, mm -hmm. uh, that's also is, a Greek, you, you have, that's a Greek responsibility. But this is, but this is, this is a... I can explain it to you. As long as, long as the big, I, as no, long but, as uh, the big... Let me answer this, uh, this uh, gentleman. Yeah. Uh, he, he, is, uh, he is very much in favor of, he is always applauding you all the time, <laughs> I see that. So most of the time he's alone, but he's applauding all the time. Uh, so but let me try to explain. It's true that there was not enough control on the funds. And we have started in the second Barroso Commission to be very much uh, more precisely and tougher on this. And it was in fact an Austrian commissioner, Mr. Hahn, yeah. who started with this. He's an excellent guy, by the way. Yeah. Um, he has started this, and this is, I, 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 I will never claim that everything that Europe does is good, you know, I mean, and not at all. So, and I, I already said you need much more control, but you cannot say that it's only the responsibility of the European Union, it's also the responsibility of all these Greek politicians, whether from Neo Democracia or from PASOK, that have never done anything with the enormous flow of funds that came from Europe. That's what has happened in Greece. Yeah, but okay. You, you wrote about this in. Um, yeah. You wrote about this in the Europe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
You're right. <laughs> Sie haben recht. Vous avez raison, vous avez gelijk. But the, the fantastic thing about this novel is that all things we're discussing are in this novel. <laughs> ah, they are. Yeah. In all contradictions. In all contradictions. Uh, for instance, uh, there, there are echoes of uh, Mann ohne Eigenschaften von Musil hmm? about a big European project yeah. after 50 years of commission. But if things are running smoothly, as you say, why does the commission need this project? And I, in, in, a, in a letter to you, I, I called the project Albern a little bit silly and you didn't agree with me. Yeah, As you is. describe it in yeah. this book, yeah. it's, it's something barely visible, barely... Yeah, uh, we, know, uh, uh, we know that the commission from time to time tries to polish up her image. Yeah? And so it's this is, this is necessary. This, yeah, this is necessary and I tried it to show it on an example. Mm -hmm and to show uh, with this example um, the contradictions uh, which um, are coming up in the moment when the Commission tries to proceed with a project. Mm -hmm. yeah? And even with the project to polish up its image. Yeah? Um, if the Commission tries to polish up its image, uh, uh, by sure um, a lot of um, uh, member states will say, no, we don't accept it, we don't want it, uh, yeah, this, yeah, and so on. And this is yeah. what, uh, what I tried, uh, tried to, to, in the storytelling, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not a thesis novel, it's not um, uh, um, uh, 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 utopian uh, 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 no, no but it's, it is a description how it works today or so why it doesn't work. Yeah? So it's, it's uh, not socialist realism, but European realism, as yeah. I, uh, in this novel. But these, these uh, officials, they, they are busy with... On, on, auf der on, the Bühne stage darf on the stage is allowed to auf smoke. Bühne right? darf man rauchen. Yeah. Und ich bin nicht raucher. I don't smoke, okay? Okay? Uh, and we don't, th this is not schnapps, huh? this is water. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> um, um, my emotion, I, <coughs> I dropped the book. No, uh, they, they are busy with their love lives, uh, with pigs in Austria, with, with anything. This is not the image of the efficient, idealistic, uh, hard-working official. Yes. They are smoking where they are not allowed to smoke. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, because uh, they are human beings. And what uh, I was interested in uh, uh, showing exactly this. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the European Unification Project is a, a, a man-made, uh, human man-made uh, yes. project and not a big abstract. Yeah? And the people that are working there are uh, men and women like like us, they are they have their high fle uh, flying uh, ideal mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, uh, thoughts, and they have their their deep uh, problematic uh, uh, moments, and they have different interests, and they have to find compromises, and so on and so mm -hmm. on. Um, I found it very interesting that, that normally when you speak with people about the European um, uh, Union, everybody is uh, saying uni uh, European Union, it's something, it's an erratic uh, block, a very abstract thing. Yeah? And I wanted to give them a face. I wanted to show it is it's, 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 it's made by men and how are they working, what are they thinking, what are they feeling, and therefore I... I had conversations with hundreds of them, mm -hmm. yeah, and and uh, afterwards trying to typicize them, yeah, to 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 make types of it, uh, literary figures. Not one is exactly one no, of civil course, servant of the of the commission, no, but course. but every figure is a type. Stereotype. Yeah, 
That's my that's my my remark. Okay. Yeah. You, stereo, this book is a little bit stereo, made about stereotypes. Stereo in the sense of uh, the sound is coming from two sides. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yes, you, you have uh, the Cypriot woman, this, mm. this uh, son of, of uh, Czech dissidents, yeah. uh, and so on and so on. Uh, the guy with, with uh, the, the pig factory in mm. Austria. But then you have a category of officials who have no names, in fact, no faces. You call them the salamanders. Yes. What's the function of these? They are in the margin, they're always popping up and disappearing in the margin. What's the function of these guys? In yeah, the these are the young anarch uh, terrorists. Uh, they, they, they anarch are? terrorists? Carrierists. Car Carrierists. Carrierists, yeah. okay. Yeah. Which is perhaps the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, they yeah. don't smoke, don't drink, uh, do sports every yeah. day. And yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Live like we should yeah, live. Yeah. Like smoking gun is all right, but uh, smoking cigarette not, and so on. Mm, okay, yeah. But then you have another guy with a very outspoken face, uh, and he is called, listen, gentlemen, uh, ladies, Romolo Augusto Massimo Strozzi. Yeah. Romolo Augusto Romolo, Massimo yeah. Strozzi. Yeah. Romolo. Hmm? Romolo. 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 Romolo Augusto yeah. Massimo Strozzi. <coughs> An Italian aristocrat yes. of a century old family yeah. who has the name of the founder of the European Empire, the greatest emperor of the Euro yeah. uh, Roman Empire. So it is as if this European continental whole is centuries old. If there is an aristocratic international since the Middle Ages, and he's an absolutely brilliant man, uh, speaking, mm. I, I don't know how many languages, and, and so on. Why, 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 why this? I wanted to remember a simple uh. fact which is uh, forgotten as well. Um, when the commission, after the Treaty of Rome was founded, they had to fill this new institution very fastly with civil servants. Yeah? <coughs> yeah. They have to found very fast uh, qualified people um, working on this project uh, of overcoming nationalism. And they had one pool at the beginning, and this is really forgotten. They had one pool, and this pool was at, um, at the pan-Europe pan movement of the old uh, aristocrat uh, Kudnove Kalergi. This was a this was a movement before the foundation of the of the of the European Union. Uh, um, an aristocratic, uh, aristocratic movement on, uh, it was called pan-European uh, movement. Before the Second World War already? No, no, no it, was, it started in the, in the, in the, in the uh, time between the wars. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the 20s, no? Yeah, the 20s, yeah, started. Uh, Kudnov Kalergi started mm -hmm. in the 20s and they tried it there. Mm -hmm. So after 45, he tried uh, to continue with this project and so on. And this was an aristocratic movement, and you can, as a Republican, uh, say whatever you want about aristocrats, aristocrats. Yeah? But one thing they are by sure, they are no nationalists. Yeah? No, they, and they, therefore, they marry all, all over the place. Yeah. And <laughs> therefore, yeah. therefore, at the beginning, and there was a... Um, um, an interesting number of, uh, of civil servants were coming from the European aristocracy. And I tried to remember uh, uh, mm -hmm. this historical root as well, as a part of the, of the, of the history mm -hmm. of our uh, institutions. And, but why the, the, the Roman Empire in his name, Romolo Augusto Massimo, Augustus Maximus? Is it a reference to...? This was no reference, it was a typical Italian name of an aristocrat. <laughs> <laughs> Massimo. <laughs> he even had a little palace in, in Florence, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know Italy very well, yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, I, I gather, I heard, and, and now we come to a critical moment about the novel. Uh, you, you read it? 
but yeah. you didn't like it. Um, I, I read. Uh, he uh, said before that uh, he wanted to touch this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, now the moment the Joker, yeah, is here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You, you read both books, yes, of course. I, I read uh, 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 the novel and also <coughs> the Landboot. Uh, the Landboot. And, uh, and the um, Hauptstadt. I yeah. very much agree with the analysis in the Landboot. Which I find far too idealistic, but okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I believe there's <coughs> a contradiction between both, between the novel and the. Uh, I agree. Uh, you don't. Uh, the, mm. um, European land Courier, borders, or the, uh, mm -hmm. the Euro European, uh, European, uh, European Courier. Courier. I think there is a contradiction. But that in itself, I mean, uh, but w my problem I have with the book, by the way, which is brilliantly written, I read some pages in German, not all of it, because that would have taken too much time. And, and I, I gather the, the, the translation is excellent too. Mm. Uh, I think the uh, translation is, is very good, although you see that it has been. Um, uh, done by a Dutchman, not by somebody from Flanders, but then it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. I mean, you can read that. It's only an advantage. It's only an advantage. Uh, but yeah. the, the problem I have is that uh, uh, the, I, the, the, to, my, to me, the plot is not plausible. It's not credible. You have not not a plot about this woman that uh, wants to, to find that. Uh, tries to organize a big manifestation for the celebration of the commission. But then you have some sidelines, for example. There is this uh, um, uh, Polish uh, uh, Christian or Catholic Roman, Roman hitman. Catholic, yeah. Roman Catholic hitman that together with uh, NATO is, is killing uh, uh, people that uh, well, are, are, not, uh, are not within the lines, you know. I mean, that's, that's more for Netflix for uh, 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 Blacklist, I believe, yeah, and, and for a novel already, of, of They're already Europe. very interested. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that, that's not, for me, that's not credible. And uh, then also, the, 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 you have different creatures, and, and all of a sudden, they, 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 they meet nevertheless. And although there's no reason why they would but all meet. But this is a small city. Um, yeah. It's not so small. But I mean, what, what I mean is that, uh, for me, it's, uh, but that may be my lacuna, but I, for me, it's not plausible enough, the plots, but it's, brilliantly written, it has a lot of humor. I couldn't write it, I could write uh, the, the, the Landboot, I think I could, not in German, but in, an, in, in, in Dutch or, or in English, but I could never make such a novel. But I, it's, for me, it's, it's too uh, implausible, it's too, um, um, well, constructed. I mean, it, it, the, the links with real life are not enough. That's my personal opinion, eh? mm -hmm. Mr. Meras, I mean, that's all. Demolishing. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I remember very, very well um, a, a figure in a Dostoevsky novel, uh, which I didn't find pl plausible as well. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time, I admired Dostoevsky and. And sometimes it, it has to do with uh, information. For example, I tried, I tried to, to make um, um, a story in which um, various um, figures uh, meet or not meet uh, in the city uh, um, uh, from different languages, different countries, different mentalities, and all of them have a, um, a, a deep, deeply in the European history uh, rooted biography. Yeah? And for example, the, the Polish hitman, um, this is a very interesting case that you, uh, that you mentioned. Um, this is um, in fact a very real problem. And a real uh, and a case in reality, which I only um, tried to to um, bring in the in, in our contemporaneity. In the Cold War, the Soldateska Christiana existed, and they had a very important role together with NATO and the Vatican in the Cold War. And after the after the end of the Cold War, suddenly they seemed to be vanished. They, nobody was, uh, was um, uh, mentioning them uh, any, anymore. anymore. Mm -hmm. And I simply said, okay, I, I, I think they are existing, they are still existing. Yeah? 
and I, I try to ask me what are they doing now? Yeah? And probably, probably my fantasy will be in 20 years a uh, historical project and uh, they will see that they really existed, still existed and did their jobs. Yeah? Killing uh, for example, now, uh, as, uh, as everybody said, uh, with the implosion of the Soviet Union, we need a new enemy. And the new enemy is Islam. And therefore, they have now this, this war. Yeah? But and not, this is, not this is maybe my fantasy, yeah, it's, it's my fantasy, mm -hmm. but it's based on a real historic mm -hmm. um, uh, um, history, mm -hmm. yeah? And, uh, okay, it's plausible, no, it's not plausible, it's part of, it's, it's only one part of, of, uh, of um, um, uh, 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 a story um, about, uh, uh, 10, 15 uh, typical, um, stereotypical uh, European figures. But what, what's the link with the uh, European Union? This is a point you didn't understand, I guess. Uh, I, <laughs> my novel is not only a novel about European Union. I came to Brussels because I was interested in researching how is European Union and the European institutions working here. And I came uh, to Brussels as the capital of European institutions. And after a certain time, I realized two things. This, would, this might be very astonishing for you, but I realized in Brussels are people living which are not working in the European institutions. <laughs> So-called Brussels. Yeah? <laughs> And the second thing, uh, what I realized is that Brussels is not only the place of the, uh, the seat of the European institutions, but it is as well the seat of NATO. And NATO puts a shadow on this city. In the running of time, you realize that. And, and then I came to the point, uh, I don't want to write only a, a a novel on uh, European Commission. I want to to write a novel um, uh, on this uh, about the city. It, it should be a city novel at the same well, time. It's, it's yeah? called Hauptstadt, yeah. capital. It should it, it, city. Yeah. it should be a city novel and not only an institution novel. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I tried to make a composition of civil servants of the uh, European Commission, Brusselers, Brusselers, and then something uh, in the shadow of, of uh, not so clear, uh, but, uh, but existing um, uh, uh, fact of, of uh, NATO in Brussels. You, to my mind, NATO has never been part of the Brussels scene. But it is here. Uh, it's, it, it's not even in Brussels. It, I mean, it's not in the city. Not at all. It's it has it's, never been. No, it's in the region. I mean, yeah, it's, it's in Avre. But Avre I mean, is part of Brussels. But it has never been part of the Brussels scene. But it is here. I think it's very much the case with the European institutions, and uh, but much less with NATO. I mean, nobody. I think a lot of people don't even realize that NATO is here. You know. It's not part of, of the political scene or, or the Brussels okay, scene. Okay, uh, I realized it. That's like NATO wants it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm, I think so. Well, uh, uh, this is an interesting point because what the Hauptstadt, uh, uh, the capital, many people think the European capital, but Brussels, of course, is the capital of Belgium and of yeah. uh, Flemish community, French community, and so on, of itself. Yeah. But you seem to, in this novel, you seem to have understood quite well uh, this highly improbable, absurd, un unplausible city which is Brussels, and that's perhaps why the novel is implausible. I mean, there's, a, for instance, uh, there's a pig running through the chapters, all the time, a pig. Why is this? Uh, what's the function of the pig? Yeah, that, that I by the way, that I like very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, I had understood that uh, Mr. Menas was going to, to read uh, something to us, but the, the the intro of, of the novel with this pig mm -hmm. uh, 
strolling around uh, Place Catherine. I mean, we have been neighbors, and eh, by the way, my, my office has always been in uh, Mansonstraat, so we were living at 200 meters difference and distance, and we never met each other. You saw the pig there. Uh, <laughs> no, but, no, but the idea that, that this pig is there, you know, that everybody's asking, so what is this pig doing here? And is there really a pig? That's, that's a beautiful, that, that's beautiful. That, that's, uh, uh, I, I like very much in the novel. What I don't mm -hmm. like is uh, where you have implausible uh, storylines story with real people. That, then I don't like it anymore. But that's my personal feeling. I mean, that, that's mm. all. But the pig, that's, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> okay. uh, more, more than this pig, there are more pigs in the, in the novel. Many, and also ears of pigs, no? <laughs> yeah. because they, they want to uh, uh, export they want to, uh, to pig ears European to pigs, China. Only Brussels pigs. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they want to export it to, to China because there they, they eat it. And, uh, then the question is, what are we doing with the rest of the pig? And that, that's, uh, uh, well, okay, but I like uh, pig meat, you know, why not? Why the pig? What is your opinion? Well, I thought uh, you have, uh, um, in relation to the pig, uh, 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 rather, um, rather strange Brussels police officer who, by the way, has the name of a big architect, Brunfond. Brunfond, yes. Uh, uh, and the, the pig is the way to show Brussels. It's, mm. it's combining the figures. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming it's from one to the other. It's a, a combining principle in, in, in your novel, pig, yeah. I think. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's combining as well uh, several general directions of the European Commission. I, mm. I think what it's, I mean, I have, uh, on, on this peak, I think the idea of the peak is in this city there are happening a lot of things that you would never expect to happen. Uh, why would all you expect time. that all of a sudden there is a peak and at the end of the book, by the way, they start saying, has there really been a peak? You know? mm -hmm. So that, that's I see as, as an, uh, a picture or as an idea to demonstrate, okay, here are sometimes happening things that uh, are completely implausible, but uh, that doesn't mean that I have to accept that what you right on the European Union is implausible, that's something else. But the idea of this pig is, it's, it, that's a, a real trouvaille, as I say it in French. How do you say that in, in, in German? Tja, wie man das? Was? A find? Hmm? Something, an un, vonst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's very good, I mean, that, that's uh, what I like very much. And it's also, uh, uh, it's not combining the figures, I think what it is really doing is, uh, saying, look, uh, everything that we see, do we really see it? Is it really the way we see it? Uh, or does we, do we just have uh, a view on it and, and that view is not necessarily corresponding to reality? That's how I read it. Mm -hmm. I'm but it makes sense, uh, especially for Brussels. It's, it's the capital of surrealism. Yeah? Um, but why I like Brussels so much and why I think it really makes sense that the European institutions are here, uh, situated in the, yeah. in the city, is that Brussels is a laboratory of the European idea. Basically, for example, it is the capital of a nation which has no nation idea. Yeah? That makes sense as a European capital. Um, uh, it's a crazy organized city with 19 mayors and so on and, and, and so they, 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 they do in a, in a small way what the European Council is trying for a whole year. <coughs> yeah. And, yeah. and um, yeah, the surrealism of the city, the, 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 this, um, uh, this love to cartoons and comics and so on, this is very special and at the same time uh, makes sense in terms of, of um, thinking and rethinking uh, uh, the, the whole continent. I, I, I had a little idea, when reading this book I had this idea that the uh, work of the European officials is contaminated by Brussels absurdity. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, they, they live in this city or in the immediate surroundings, they're working in this city, uh, biking through the city, many, many people take yeah. their bikes, uh, 
public transport mm. or they're, they're, yeah. they're just in, in rush hour, they are standing still mm. in their cars. And uh, I think they inevitably, unavoidably, they, un inevitably they are influenced by Absurdistan Brussels. Mm. Uh, that's what I read in your book. But now, uh, my final uh, mm. question, and, and it's an important, <coughs> it's half past nine, mm. and then you read. <laughs> but this is important. Uh, there is a, a very old gentleman, a little bit Alzheimer, perhaps, Mr. De Vriend, which in, in other languages is the friend, their mm. friend, mm. l'ami. Uh, he's a Jew. And he makes the reference to one of the founding experiences of Europe, of Europe, of mm. after war mm. Europe, Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. He was an inmate in Auschwitz yeah. as a young boy. Uh, and he is perfectly bilingual. He speaks uh, Dutch and yeah. French perfectly yeah. well. What's his part in, in the mechanism of your book? He remembers maybe the reader that um, uh, the idea of uh, European unification uh, in this way we try it now by overcoming nationalism um, would never have been possible without the shock of Auschwitz. And the founding fathers um, uh, explained it in a very clear way. Yeah. For example, the first president of the European Commission was a German, Walter Hallstein. Yeah. And he said um, the, the shock of uh, the experience of Auschwitz um, is the base of the chance and the possibility now to overcome uh, the, the, all the conflicts of the concurrence uh, of, um, um, of European nations. Um, Auschwitz was the example for the radical consequence of nationalism. And at the same time, in Auschwitz died the idea of national identity. Because in Auschwitz, it, um, uh, it, it, was, um, it, had, it, it had not any importance anymore if you are Polish or German or Austrian or Spanish or Italian. This idea of, of uh, national identity was killed in this uh, in this uh, camps as well, and all the the people present in this camp um, wanted, in the case of surviving, only one thing: not the reconstruction of the national identity. They wanted the the life in dignity uh, and 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 the right uh, based on human rights in a, in, in in Europe. And therefore, in, uh, in Auschwitz, Hallstein said it in his uh, famous uh, first speech as first uh, president of the European Commission. He said, therefore, we start here, we start with the experience of Auschwitz for overcoming everything, every aggression on this continent and the nationalism which led to Auschwitz. And this is um, also uh, contemporarily uh, uh, forgotten. Yeah? Nobody says um, uh, we should take care. Um, uh, it is an eternal, uh, eternal um, um, lesson we got yeah? um, for the construction of, of peace on this continent. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't um, play any role anymore in the, in the, in the actual discussions. In the contrary, we see the renationalization mm -hmm. in all member states of the European Union. Yeah? And they want all that back. What in last consequence led to Auschwitz? And uh, therefore it's necessary to, to, to remember this, this aspect and this moment of European history. 
And at the same time, especially when I write uh, a novel about Brussels, because uh, 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 Belgic and Brussels resistance made the unique um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the unique uh, trying of stopping uh, a train to Auschwitz yeah. here in, 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 in Belgium. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the famous uh, 20th uh, yeah. deportation train, yeah, which is in my in my understanding, uh, a almost holy, mm -hmm. saint um, Belgian um, uh, story. And um, this figure is one of the survivors uh, of this, uh, of, this, of, the, uh, of, this uh, of this assault of, on, the, on the 20th deportation train. But he dies in your novel. Yeah, at the end, because everybody is dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Especially all elder, elder <laughs> people. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Manasse. Uh, thank you very much, Karel de Hucht. Uh, now we're going to listen to your reading. Yeah. We have time. Yeah, we have time. Yeah. You can read the whole novel <laughs> <laughs> as you like it. No. Hmm. You said that you can't read the whole novel. Nee, aber den Prolog soll ich lesen. Den Prolog, ja, der ja. ist da übersetzt worden. Are you, yeah. are you still patient for... for yeah. Yes, yes. Der eager for... <laughs> you get ladies with me? I was told I, I, I should read the, the very beginning of the novel, the Prolog, in German, and you will get a translation, I don't know how, here? It, uh, yes, yeah. it's... Um, Yeah. Good old Brussels okay. Da läuft ein Schwein. David de Vriend sah es, als er ein Fenster des Wohnzimmers öffnete, um noch ein letztes Mal den Blick über den Platz schweifen zu lassen, bevor er diese Wohnung für immer verließ. Er war kein sentimentaler Mensch. Er hatte 60 Jahre hier gewohnt, 60 Jahre lang auf diesen Platz geschaut und jetzt schloss er damit ab. Das war alles. Das war sein Lieblingssatz. Wann immer er etwas erzählen, berichten, bezeugen sollte, sagte er zwei oder drei Sätze und dann, das war alles. Dieser Satz war für ihn die einzig legitime Zusammenfassung von jedem Moment oder Abschnitt seines Lebens. Die Umzugsfirma hatte die paar Habseligkeiten abgeholt, die er an die neue Adresse mitnahm. Habselig. Ein merkwürdiges Wort, das aber keine Wirkung auf ihn hatte. Dann sind die Männer von der Entrümpelungsfirma gekommen, um alles Übrige wegzuschaffen. Nicht nur, was nicht nied- und nagelfest war, sondern auch die Nieten und Nägel. Sie rissen heraus, zerlegten, transportierten ab, bis die Wohnung besenrein war, wie man das nannte. De Friend hatte sich einen Kaffee gemacht, solange der Herd noch da war und seine Espressomaschine da stand, den Männern zugeschaut, darauf achtend, ihnen nicht im Weg zu stehen. Noch lange hatte er die leere Kaffeetasse in der Hand gehalten und sie schließlich in einen Müllsack fallen lassen. Dann waren die Männer fort, die Wohnung leer, besenrein, das war alles. Und Jetzt noch ein letzter Blick aus dem Fenster. Es gab da unten nichts, was er nicht kannte und nun musste er ausziehen, weil eine andere Zeit gekommen war und da sah er tatsächlich, da unten lief ein Schwein. Mitten in Brüssel, in St. Catherine, es musste von der Rue de la Prée gekommen sein, lief den Bauzaun vor dem Haus entlang. Die Friend beugte sich aus dem Fenster und sah, wie das Schwein nun rechts an der Ecke zum Vieux Marché, einigen Passanten ausweichend, beinahe vor ein Taxi lief. Kai Uwe Fricke von der Notbremsung nach vorn geworfen, fiel in den Sitz zurück. Er verzog das Gesicht, er kam zu spät, er war genervt. Was war jetzt wieder los? Er war nicht wirklich zu spät. Es war nur so, dass er bei einem Treffen immer Wert darauf legte, zehn Minuten vor der vereinbarten Zeit da zu sein, vor allem an Regentagen, um sich auf der Toilette noch schnell wieder in Ordnung zu bringen, das regennasse Haar, die beschlagene Brille, 
bevor die Person kam, mit der er verabredet war. Ein Schwein, haben Sie das gesehen, Monsieur? rief der Taxifahrer. Springt mir fast von den Wagen. Er beugte sich weit über das Lenkrad. Da, da, sehen Sie es. Jetzt sah es Kai Uwe Frick. Er wischte mit dem Handrücken über die Scheibe. Das Schwein lief seitlich weg. Schmutzig rosa glänzte der nasse Leib des Tiers im Licht der Laternen. Wir sind da, Missionär, kann ich nicht ranfahren. Also sowas läuft mein Schwein fast in den Wagen. Schwein gehabt, kann man da nur sagen. <lacht> Fenja Xenopolo saß im Restaurant Menelas am ersten Tisch neben dem großen Fenster mit Blick über den Platz. Sie ärgerte sich, dass sie viel zu früh gekommen war. Das war nicht souverän, wenn sie schon wartend da saß, wenn er kam. Sie war nervös. Sie hatte befürchtet, dass es wegen des Regens einen Stau geben würde. Sie hatte zu viel Wegzeit einkalkuliert und nun saß sie bereits beim zweiten Uso. Der Kellner umschwirrte sie wie eine lästige Wespe. Sie starrte das Glas an und befahl sich, es nicht anzurühren. Der Kellner brachte eine Karaffe mit frischem Wasser. Dann brachte er einen kleinen Teller mit Oliven und sagte, »Ein Schwein?« »Wie bitte?« Fenja blickte auf und sah, dass der Kellner gebannt auf den Platz hinausschaute und nun sah sie es. Das Schwein lief auf das Restaurant zu in einem lächerlichen Galopp, diese kurzen vor- und zurückschwingenden Beinchen unter dem runden, schweren Körper. Sie dachte zuerst, das sei ein Hund, eines von diesen abstoßenden Biestern, die von Witwen gemästet werden. Aber nein. Es war tatsächlich ein Schwein, fast wie aus einem Bilderbuch. Sie sah den Rüssel, die Ohren als Linien, als Konturen. So zeichnet man für Kinder ein Schwein. Aber dieses schien aus einem Horror-Kinderbuch entsprungen. Es war kein Wildschwein. Es war ein verdrecktes, aber eindeutig großer Hausschwein, das etwas Irres hatte, etwas Bedrohliches. Am Fenster lief das Regenwasser herunter, verschwommen sah Fenja Xenopolo, wie das Schwein plötzlich vor einigen Passanten abbremste, die Beinchen durchgestreckt, es rutschte, warf sich zur Seite, knickte ein, gewann wieder Boden und galoppierte zurück nun in Richtung Hotel Atlas. In diesem Moment verließ Richard Oswiecki das Hotel. Schon beim Verlassen des Lifts, während er das Hotelfoyer durchquerte, hatte er sich die Kapuze seiner Jacke über den Kopf gezogen. Nun trat er hinaus in den Regen, eilig, aber nicht zu schnell. Er wollte nicht auffallen, der Regen war ein Glück. Kapuze, eiliger Schritt, das war unter diesen Gegebenheiten völlig normal und unauffällig. Niemand sollte später aussagen können, er habe einen Mann flüchten sehen, etwas so alt, schätzungsweise so groß. Und die Farbe der Jacke natürlich, die wisse er auch noch. Rasch wandte er sich nach rechts, da hörte er, aufgeregte Rufe, einen Schrei und ein seltsam quietschendes Keuchen. Da hielt er kurz inne, schaute zurück und jetzt bemerkte er das Schwein. Er konnte nicht glauben, was er sah. Da stand ein Schwein zwischen zwei dieser schmiedeeisernen Pfosten, die den Vorplatz des Hotels säumten. Es stand da mit gesenktem Kopf in der Haltung eines Stiers, bevor er zum Angriff übergeht. Das hatte etwas Lächerliches. Zugleich doch bedrohlich ist. Es war völlig rätselhaft. Woher kam dieses Schwein? Wieso stand es da? Richard Oswetzki hatte den Eindruck, dass alles Leben auf diesem Platz, zumindest so weit er ihn nun überblickte, erstarrt und eingefroren war. Die kleinen Augen des Tiers reflektierten schimmernd das Neonlicht der Hotelfassade. Da begann Richard Oswetzki zu laufen. Er lief nach rechts weg, blickte nochmals zurück. Das Schwein riss schnaufend den Schädel hoch, machte ein paar kleine Schritte rückwärts, drehte sich um und rannte nun quer über den Platz hinüber zu der Baumreihe vor dem flämischen Kulturzentrum, dem Markten. Die Passanten, die die Szene beobachtet hatten, sahen dem Schwein nach und nicht dem Mann mit der Kapuze. Und jetzt sah Martin Sussmann. Das Tier. Er wohnte in dem Haus neben dem Hotel Atlas, öffnete just in diesem Moment das Fenster, um zu lüften und traute seinen Augen nicht. Das hat jetzt ausgesehen wie ein Schwein. Er hatte gerade über sein Leben nachgedacht, über die Zufälle, die dazu geführt hatten, dass er, ein Kind österreichischer Bauern, nun in Brüssel lebte und arbeitete. Er war in einer Stimmung, in der ihm alles verrückt und fremd erschien, aber ein frei laufendes Schwein da unten auf dem Platz, das war allzu verrückt. Das konnte nur ein Streich seiner Fantasie sein, eine 
Projektion seiner Erinnerungen. Er schaute noch einmal, aber da sah er das Schwein nicht mehr. Das Schwein lief inzwischen auf die Kirche St. Kathrin zu, querte die Rue St. Kathrin, hielt sich links den Touristen ausweichend, die aus der Kirche kamen, lief an der Kirche vorbei zum Keobrick. Die Touristen lachten. Sie hielten wohl das gestresste, fast schon kollabierende Tier für Folklore, für irgendein lokales Phänomen. Manche würden später im Reiseführer suchen, ob es dazu eine Erklärung gab. Werden nicht im spanischen Pamplona an irgendeinem Feiertag Stiere durch die Straßen der Stadt getrieben? Vielleicht macht man das in Brüssel mit Schweinen. Wenn man das Unbegreifliche dort erlebt, wo man gar nicht erwartet, alles zu verstehen, wie heiter ist dann das Leben? In diesem Moment bog Goda Mustafa um die Ecke und stieß fast mit dem Schwein zusammen. Fast hatte sie nicht doch berührt, sein Bein gestreift, ein Schwein. Goda Mustafa sprang in Panik zur Seite, verlor das Gleichgewicht und fiel. Und nun lag er in einer Pfütze, wälzte sich herum, was die Sachen noch schlimmer machte. Aber es war nicht der Dreck der Gosse, es war die Berührung, wenn es denn überhaupt eine gewesen war, mit dem unreinen Tier, durch die er sich beschmutzt fühlte. Da sah er eine Hand, die sich zu ihm hinunterstreckte, er sah das Gesicht eines älteren Herrn, ein trauriges, besorgtes Gesicht, regennass, der alte Mann schien zu weinen. Das war Professor Alois Erhardt. Goda Mustafa verstand nicht, was er sagte, er verstand nur das Wort okay. Okay, okay, sagte Goda Mustafa. Professor Erhard redete weiter auf Englisch. Er sagte, dass auch er heute schon gestürzt sei, aber er war so konfus, dass er fehlt, sagte statt Fell. Goda Mustafa verstand ihn nicht, sagte noch einmal, okay. Da kam schon das Blaulicht, die Rettung, Polizei, der ganze Platz rotierte, flackerte, zuckte im Blaulicht. Die Einsatzfahrzeuge rasten heulend zum Hotel Atlas. Der Himmel über Brüssel tat seine Schuldigkeit. Es regnete und jetzt schien es blau blitzende Tropfen zu regnen. Dazu nun ein starker Windstoß, der manchen Passanten den Regenschirm hochriss und umstülpte. Goda Mustafa nahm die Hand von Professor Erhard und ließ sich aufhelfen. Sein Vater hatte ihn vor Europa gewarnt.